it's just afternoon central time, which means it's my privilege to welcome you to today's alumni career webinar, Slicing Pie, How to Divide Equity in a Startup with Mike Moyer. My name is Maggie Almarakti, and I'm the Assistant Director of Career Programs for Alumni Career and Affinity Programs here at the University of Chicago. Our office is committed to helping provide alumni with the resources they need to stay competitive in an ever-changing job market and support the alumni community with career resources, networking channels, and job search capabilities. It's my privilege to introduce you to our presenter today, UChicago Booth School of Business alumnus Mike Moyer. Mike is a 2004 graduate of the Booth School of Business and is currently Managing Director of Lake Shark Ventures, LLC. He is an entrepreneur who has started a number of companies, including Banana Graphics, a product development, development and merchandising company, Moondog, an outdoor clothing manufacturing company, Vicarious Communication, Inc., a marketing technology company for the medical industry, CapEx.com, a site that helps students find the right college, and College Peas LLC, which provides publications and consulting on a variety of topics, including college admissions, trade shows, and job search. Mike teaches entrepreneurship at Northwestern University and the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. He is also the author of several books, including Slicing Pie, How to Make Colleges Want You, College Peas, and Trade Show Samurai. Today's webinar will outline a simple method for dividing equity in an early stage company that determines exactly the right number of shares for each participant. You will learn the best way to divide up equity so all partners get what they deserve, as well as how to calculate a relative value for all inputs to your company. Now, let's get to the reason you've all joined today, and let me welcome Mike. Hello, uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, you should be looking at a picture of a mouse on a swing set right now. That is because uh, research has shown that looking at pictures of cute animals helps you learn faster and better and retain information. So my classes at Northwestern and the University of Chicago usually start with a picture of a cute animal. And today, of course, we're going to talk about equity splits. But first, I want to make a public service announcement for a class that I teach at University of Chicago that some of the people in the audience may be interested in participating in. It's called the New Venture and Small Enterprise, Enterprise Lab class. And in that class, we pair uh, MBA students with your company to work on a 10-week project, uh, handling anything you want us to handle, everything from marketing to uh, sales operations, uh, financing, all kinds of things. So our students handle all kinds of projects that small enterprises and new ventures tackle. And so if you're interested in participating in that class, please fill out a client application at uh, 34701.org. That's our class number, 34701.org. Um, and I'd love to... Uh, to have your, your company as a client of ours. That's for, mostly for Chicago-based companies. So there are lots of people on this call, and if some are interested, please fill it out. Uh, we're going to talk about a model called Slicing Pie today. And I'll put this up at the end, but if you want to uh, contact me at Mike at Slicing Pie, you're welcome to. And you can download a copy of these slides or similar slides at slicingpie.com slash feedback. Um, please don't uh, ignore the feedback uh, survey that the Alumni Association has. This is one way to get the slide. I'm always willing to answer questions and do as much as I can to help you out. Um, but the first question I typically ask uh, companies, entrepreneurs, is why do they start companies in the first place? And why do we do this? And why are you compelled to do such a risky thing? And the reason I think is true is that people think they're going to solve a major problem in life or just help people address a major issue or change the world for the better knowing it's going to be hard work, but they'll have fun along the way and they'll get a big payout. Most people would agree that starting a company and working for yourself is more fun than working for the man. And that's because you get to be your own boss, you get to make your own decisions, you get to set your own destiny, um, even though it's usually a lot harder work. And you look forward to a giant, big, fat payout at the end. And the problem is we don't know what that payout's going to be. Um, so we're, we're betting on the future, an unknown future, and it could be a lot, it could be a little. Uh, in most cases, it's nothing. Most companies go out of business. So we try very hard to, to figure out what the future is going to be worth. We do financial projections. We ask people what the chances are. We do valuations of our company, all kinds of things, trying to figure out what it's going to be worth. And today, most people base their equity splits on this future value. Most equity splits today are based on un unknowable things, predictions about the future, negotiation skills, rules of thumb, people guessing about what the right thing should be, what it feels right, 
um, and it causes a lot of problems. Um, but the success criteria should generally be we make lots of money, we achieve our mission, and you get your fair share. Because if it's fair, it'll be fun. And if you're not treated fairly, if you're not getting paid fairly, if your ideas are not respected, if you're not respected or anything like that, it won't be fun and you'll wind up giving up. And I had a CTO once who used to say, the biggest problem is not that people will give up and, and, and leave the company, that they'll give up, give up and stay at the company and create a cancer from within. And you see lots of companies failing. And I believe that uh, founder disputes and, and people not being felt that they're being treated fairly is one of the major reasons for failure in the startup world. And in fact, there's some research backing up on this. Which brings you to what I call the perfectly fair equity calculation. In a perfect world, your share, the percentage of the company that you should own, should equal the value of your contribution divided by the total value of the firm. That creates a perfectly fair equity split. The problem, and many of you should recognize right away there's a problem with this, the problem is twofold. First, it's impossible to value your contribution in terms of future value, what, what value you're adding to the firm. There's no way to do this. You can guess, you can negotiate, you can argue about it, but there's no good way to know this. To make matters worse, the total value of the firm is usually worth nothing. Most startup companies are worth zero, and as a result, you cannot divide by zero. And by the way, just so everyone knows, this model is for bootstrapping a new venture. It's not for dividing up equity in established companies or public companies. It's for, it's for using equity to substitute for cash. If people have plenty of money, you can just pay everybody for their contributions. You pay their salaries. You buy your supplies. You pay your rent. You don't need to do give, give up equity. Um, that's the beauty of having a lot of money. If you don't have a lot of money, you can't pay your people and you can't pay your rent. And you can't pay these things. You have to use something else, and equity is the next best thing. So this perfectly fair equity calculation, therefore, is, is fundamentally flawed, yet people keep trying to do this. They, kind of, they keep trying to figure out value of the contribution. They try to predict the value of the firm. It just does not work. So what they wind up doing is what's called a fixed equity split. And a fixed equity split, 67% of companies do this at the outset of the venture. It means the first major deal they do is they sit down with their partners and they hash it out. They figure out what, what equity do you get, what equity do I get. And the fixed equity split implies that Equity is doled out in the beginning. And if you think about this process, and in spite of the fact that it's extremely, extremely, extremely common, if you think about it, it's kind of like giving someone their entire salary on day one. If you don't have cash, you're using equity instead of cash. To give someone a fixed chunk of equity on day one is the same thing as giving them their salary on day one, which sounds stupid because it is stupid. And yet for some reason, people think it's okay to dole out equity in this fashion. And it always creates problems, in my opinion. It's always going to be an issue. Most people, 90% of startups, do equal splits. 50-50 uh, is by far the most common way to split the equity between two people. And I'm sure there are lots of people in the audience today who have been in a 50-50 split before. Sometimes there's three people, so each get a third. Or there's four people, so each get 25%. Equal splits are extremely common because they're very easy. And doing a fixed split is easy. You just shake your hand and you walk away. The struggle that you'll face is unwinding all the legal and financial hassles that happen when you realize you've made a mistake. Unwinding a fixed equity split is extremely difficult. And there's many cases this can actually destroy your company. But it's extremely common. Sometimes people do a fixed split, but they change the, the ratio a little bit. They'll do 60-40. Maybe one guy had the idea and maybe he's working full time, the other guy's not, so they do a 60-40 split. Well, oftentimes you'll see a, a well-meaning advisor or attorney say, oh, you gotta have to make sure someone's in control. So you have to have 51%. So, you know, tough decisions are made by someone. This implies that if I have a decision that's so unpopular that nobody wants to do it, I can exercise my 51% vote. My feeling is that if you're making decisions based on the number of shares you have, you probably aren't being in much of a very collaborative team. So this is also problematic. But still, these things create problems. Because if something changes, your equity still would be wrong. So let's say you go in 50-50, and you do all the work, and I do nothing. I own half your company. Well, what if I'm a marketing guy, and you're a technology person, and you want to bring in a technology person for help? Does it come out of your share, or does it come out of my share? I'm not getting any help. You are. Well, what if uh, one of your partners wants to quit? What happens to their equity? There's a great movie called Startup.com, which one of the early founders quits the company and they had to pay him a million dollars or almost a million dollars to get his equity back. He's the only guy in the entire company who makes a dime. The guy that poops out in the beginning and quits makes all the money, everyone else loses their shirt. 
Or what if you want to quit? Or what if your CTO gets hit by a bus? I was in a situation once. I was advising a guy, and he had started a company with his, one of his friends. They had a 50-50 split, and he, the friend was a CTO. They had built the software. They had some good traction. They're moving forward. They're making some good revenues, and the CTO got hit by a bus and died almost instantly. His wife inherited his 50%. And the founder, the, other, the surviving founder, felt like that was the right thing to do, but he was very conflicted about the fact that all of his profits from then on out had to be shared with this woman who was providing no value whatsoever to the firm. And they had a long way to go. And she didn't want to give it back, and she didn't want, he couldn't afford to buy it back, and other people didn't want to come in and join the company because this woman owned 50%, and she wasn't adding any value. So this, this equity split created uh, an insurmountable problem for this man's widow and this man's partner. There are millions of things that can change in your company. In fact, startup companies change constantly. The only thing that never changes is the fact that they're always changing. So no matter what you do with your fixed split, no matter how careful you are or how good your advisors are or how carefully you plan, no matter what you do, something is going to change. And the instant it changes, your equity split is no longer going to be fair. So one of these two things will be true. The first one is, you'll see this a little greater than sign. The, the value of your contribution is greater than, over the total value is greater than your, what you deserve. That means you have more than your fair share. And sometimes people are okay with having more than their fair share. They figure, hey, if it's going to go wrong, might as well go wrong in my favor. And that's understandable. But usually if you find someone like that, you don't really want to work with them. You don't want to work with people who are willing to benefit at someone else's expense. The flip side of the coin is this less than sign, meaning you have less than your fair share. And very few people are comfortable having less than their fair share. In, case, in fact, when they figure out they have less than their fair share, they become very uncomfortable with the firm, and that creates a lot of problems. So both scenarios are, are, are problems, and they both exist all the time in a fixed split scenario. I call these alligator pit problems, alligator pit negotiations. There's the less than gator, and there's the greater than gator. And what this means is when you go to negotiate with your partners, you know deep down inside that you're going to walk away either with less than you deserve or more than you deserve. And so every fixed equity split negotiation on the planet brings with it the same feelings you might bring to an alligator pit. You want to get out of there as fast as you can, so you might do 50-50 just, just, just to end the discussion, or you might have self-preservation in mind, or you might uh, not care about the other person. You want to get in and out fast, or you want to get as much as you can for yourself and get out of there. These are not the kind of emotions you want to bring to the table with your founding partners. Knowing that you're going to get bitten is not the way to approach this negotiating table. So we have a big problem here. If it's not fair, it will not be fun. Your company will ultimately be doomed. And I've personally faced this problem many times in my career, and I've always looked for a solution. This is what I've come up with. What we need in order to solve this problem is a perfectly fair split. Not kind of fair or almost fair, a perfectly fair split. Everyone needs to have exactly what they deserve. We want to reward actual contributions to the firm, actual work being performed, actual money being spent, actual things happening, not promises about future contributions or hopes for the future. We want to reward actual contributions. We want to provide ongoing motivation to continue. It's very common for a minority shareholder to just to kind of walk away and stop participating because they have such a small share. We want to provide ongoing motivation. We want to accommodate team changes, knowing that people are going to come and go throughout the early stages of our company. We need to have a model that reflects that. In a fixed split, we have to go back to the negotiating table, and once we figure out our new split, we have to go back to our attorneys and have them sign new documents uh, and fill out new documents for us. So it's, it's, it's a legal hassle, it's a negotiation hassle. We've got to accommodate changes in the team. We want to make it so it's flexible in the face of rapid change. Things change very quickly, and we can't stop and renegotiate our equity every, every single time something changes. And we want to get rid of the gator. We want everyone to know that they're being treated fairly no matter what and that they won't be taken advantage of. So that's the criteria for the model I'm about to present to you. The process we're going to use is called a dynamic equity split. And research has shown that dynamic equity splits are the solution to this problem. What I'm going to describe to you today is a model for implementing a dynamic equity split. And the word dynamic means is that it changes over time. It self-adjusts over time to make sure it stays fair. So if you contributed 23.2% of what it took to get there, you should get 23.2% of the reward when it comes, no more, no less. A dynamic split will allow you to do this. In particular, the model I'm going to talk about today will allow you to do that. If it's fair, it will be fine. So the model that I've invented 
and that I speak about all over the world, and people buy the books and implement this all over the place. It's called a grunt fund. And there's two pieces to the grunt fund. The first is the allocation framework. The allocation framework is a formula for calculating the right shares for everyone in the company. The recovery framework determines the right buyout price when someone leaves the firm. Inevitably, someone is going to leave the company, either under good or bad circumstances. You have to be able to calculate the right buyout price so everyone gets what they deserve. If you don't have a, buyout, uh, a method for doing this, you have to guess or negotiate a buyout price, which is always too high for the buyer and always too low for the seller. You're going to have to come up with the right price here. So there's two pieces, and I'll talk about both of them today. The allocation framework is very simple. The first thing you do is convert to slices, and I'll take you through detail how to convert to slices. A slice is a fictional measure of risk, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Every time you contribute something, you're taking risk, so your share should always be equal to your slices divided by all the slices contributed by everybody, so your risk divided by all the risk taken. And every day something change, every day more contributions are made, the pie will change. It'll self-adjust over time to make sure it stays fair. So the three steps are convert to slices, calculate shares by dividing your share, your slices by all the slices, and allowing it to self-adjust over time. This will guarantee you to have exactly the equity you deserve, no more and no less. And I'm going to go into more detail about how this works. When we invest in a startup company, either our time or our money or our ideas or relationships or facilities or supplies or equipment or anything else, we are basically making a bet on the future of that company. In the same way you might make a bet at the blackjack table, you're betting on the future of that company, having no idea what the return is actually going to be. When you put a dollar on the blackjack table, and your friend puts a dollar on the blackjack table, and you win, you each get half the proceeds because you took, each took exactly half the risk. It's no different in a startup company. We try to think about what our value add is going to be, what, our, what value we're creating, what the future value, all these things we try to create. What we're really doing is we're making a contribution and we're risking that contribution. The value of that risk is very, very specific. It's equal to what we would have otherwise been paid for the same contribution in some company that could afford to pay us. In other words, it's our opportunity cost or better, the fair market value of that contribution. Everything has a fair market value. And that helps us understand what the risk that's being taken. So to convert to slices, you simply take the fair market value of the contributions being made. And there's two types of contributions that can be made. And I'll show you some examples of how this calculation works. A non-cash contribution does not, create, does not require cash out of pocket. So a person's time is the most common uh, non-cash contribution. I, oops. Ideas. Uh, facilities like office space or warehouse space or manufacturing space, relationships when people bring big Rolex to, to, to the company, uh, equipment, supplies, credit cards, uh, office supplies, things like that. And of course, cash, a cash contribution is cash spent on the company either as a cash investment or unreimbursed expenses. It's much harder to come by cash than it is to come by non cash contributions. People have plenty of time, usually, they don't have very much cash. In fact, if you had plenty of cash, you wouldn't need to use an equity model because you can just pay for everything. But this model implies that there are going to be non-cash contributions. So all you do is take the fair market value, which is what you would have otherwise been paid for the same contribution by some company who could afford to pay, and you apply a multiplier. When we invest in a startup company, we are assuming the risk that we'll never get paid. And the risk happens to be extremely extremely high. In fact, you're virtually guaranteed to lose all of your money every time you bet on a startup company because their failure rate is so high, probably upwards of 90%. It's one of, the, one of the worst investments you can make. But if it pays out, it could pay out great and it's fun, so people tend to, to, to gravitate towards startup companies. But the fair market value, whatever you would have been paid by somebody else, is what you're risking. And you apply a multiplier. The multiplier, in this case, it's twice for a non-cash contribution or four times for a cash contribution. The multiplier reflects the fact you're taking a ton of risk. It's not market interest rates, it's a huge amount. So we get 2x on our, our non-cash contributions and 4x on our cash contributions. And these multipliers are based on my experience and people always want to change them but I always recommend keeping them the same. They, all, they actually create some consequences 
when we, we recover the shares that we'll talk about later. For now, we're, we're going to take the fair market value of the contribution. We're going to apply a multiplier to reflect the risk, and that's going to determine the number of slices that go into our pie. So here's an example. For time, you would take the person's fair market salary. You would subtract any cash compensation, because if I pay you cash, you're t I'm taking risk away. I would multiply it by 2 to, rep to represent the risk that's being taken. I would divide by 2,000, which is roughly the number of hours in a year. And I would get my grunt hourly resource rate, or grrr, which is the sound you make when you're working hard on your startup company, either coding or marketing or whatever else you're doing. You make that sound. So here's an example. Let's say you're the kind of person that can earn $100,000 on the open market. The company pays you $25,000, meaning you're putting $75,000 at risk. The unpaid portion is $75,000. You multiply it by 2 and divide by 2,000. That gives you a grunt hourly resource rate, or grrr, of 75 slices per hour. That means every hour that you work on this company doing great brilliant idea generation or checking your email or whatever else you do for the company, you are contributing 75 slices per hour. So the pie grows by 75 slices per hour for every hour that you work on the company. For small amounts of cash, you take the cash that's spent on the company and multiply it by four. So I put a dollar in and spend a dollar, I get four slices back. And you convert investments when the money is actually spent. So I could invest $10,000 in your company. It's not really at risk until you start spending the money. So the founder takes the money out of the savings account, puts it in the checking account, and pays bills, knowing full well that every dollar he spends or she spends translates to four slices, um, reflecting the risk that's being taken. So money is counted as slices when it's spent on the firm. And the same goes for unreimbursed expenses. If I buy an airline ticket, it's worth four, four times in slices. Equipment. If I buy a piece of equipment for the company and I spend cash out of pocket, it's treated as cash and it's an unreimbursed expense. If I had the equipment in my backyard and it's less than a year old, I might use the purchase price because it's a non-cash contribution because I didn't buy it for the company. If it's an old piece of equipment, I might look at eBay and figure out the book value um, and use it as a non-cash contribution. Everything has a fair market value. Relationships, the fair market value relationship, or a Rolodex, someone comes with a big Rolodex, if they can convert those relationships into sales, they would get, an un, they would get a commission. If I didn't pay that commission, it would be treated as an unpaid, uh, unpaid non-cash contribution, so it would be times two. So if I sold $1,000 worth of something to someone and I had a 10% commission of $100 and it was not paid out, I would get 200 slices. Ideas, people always want to know what an idea is worth. An idea in the open market, in the fair market, is usually rewarded with a royalty. So if you're a rock star and you write a great song, you get a royalty. If you're an inventor and the car company uses your invention on the car, they give you a royalty on revenues generated. If they don't pay you the cash, they owe you two times in slices. This is a very important point because so often companies pivot away from the original idea. So founders have a tendency to think that their idea was everything. And they want big chunks of equity for coming up with ideas. But it's so common to pivot away from an idea. We don't want to reward an idea that does not create value, does not create sales. If your idea does not generate revenue, it's not worth much. So we only provide slices in the pie when the company starts producing income as a result of that, that uh, idea, either in the sale of the company or in uh, revenues. If you buy supplies for the, for the office at your own expense, it's unreimbursed, it's treated as cash. Everything has a noble, unambiguous fair market value, whereas the future value that we use or predictions about the future are unknowable. So let me show you how this works in action. So these are some startup guys, gals looking for a job. We're going to hire a few of them and create a new company. We have grunt number one, a junior developer right out of college building some WordPress websites for us. We have the founder. She had a great idea and had uh, brought some equipment and supplies and put, put a lot of time in. And her rich uncle put some cash in and brought some important relationships to help them move the company forward in terms of sales and investment. All you do is convert to slices using the formula I just went over. And you add up all the slices, which gives you a total slices. And you divide each person's slices by the total number of slices. There's grunt number one. There's grunt number two.
And here's grunt number three. You divided their slices by the total. And here's what our pie looks like. As you can see, the uncle has 60% of the pie, the founder has 33%, and the junior developer has 7%. It's perfectly logical that the junior developer would not have nearly as big a chunk as the uncle who put all the money up and, and had the good connections. Nor would that person have as much equity as the founder who had the idea and put a lot of time in. It's also logical that the founder would not have as much as the uncle because the uncle put up all the cash, took most of the risk. So in this case, the slicing pie model has properly allocated the shares in this particular pie. Now let's pretend for a moment that none of these guys or gals does any more work just for a second while they bring in a new person. In this case, we're going to find a sales guy. His name is Barry. He's going to provide some sales, put some time in, and bring some important relationships to the firm, generate some revenue. All we do with Barry is convert his stuff to slices, just like everybody else's. We add them into the base, just like we did everybody else. Now again, we're pretending no one else did any more work. And we recalculate everyone's shares. So there's grunt number one. Now we're pretending that grunt number one didn't do any more work. Grunt number two. Grunt number three. Now in reality, each person would be doing more work and adding more slices. For simplicity, I'm not doing that. And here's grunt number four, this Barry, the sales guy, with his Rolodex. And now you have a new split. This pie shows that the uncle and everyone has, and the founder and the junior developer have slightly less equity because the sales guys came in as, as they're in 13% in this pie. But that's okay because the pie is bigger. It's always important to focus on the forward motion of the company, the growing company, and less important to focus on the actual percentage that you have. The slicing pie model will always give you exactly what you deserve to have relative to the other folks in the, in the firm. It will never give you more than you deserve. It will never give you less than you deserve. It may not give you what you want to have. You might want more, but it'll always give you what you deserve to have. So in this case, the pie is properly allocated automatically based on the calculations in the slicing pie model. Now, eventually somebody may leave your company. People leaving companies and startups is extremely common. And there are four reasons why you can leave a company. The first reason is you can be fired for good reason. This is things like embezzlement, sexual harassment, bringing a gun to work, or most common one is not doing your job. And in the grunt fund model and hopefully in your real life, firing someone for good reason means they aren't doing their job and you have to give them a warning before you can fire them. In fact, you've got to give them two warnings. Warning, warning, fire. You have to give them a warning because they may not know they're not performing. They may not know how to perform. They may not, may not be aware that you want something different than you're actually doing. If you don't give them a warning, it's not fair. And this is a model about fairness. This is a, this is a model, I call, often call this not a legal agreement, but a moral agreement. Doing right by the people who help you get to where you're going. So if you want to fire someone for good reason, you have to give them a warning first, unless they brought a gun to work, or sexually harassed someone, or sold from the company. You can also fire them for no good reason, meaning you can fire them for whatever else you want. So without warning, is no good reason. And this is very common too. Companies will let people go for no reason. They can resign for good reason. Resigning for good reason implies that the job has changed substantially enough that's no longer what you signed up for. So you have a good reason to resign. So for instance, if your title and responsibilities were changed dramatically, you were the marketing person and now you're the burger flipper. That would be resignation. You, that, would, that would give you a good reason to resign. If the company moves to Singapore and wants you to just pack your bags and move the company to Singapore, that would be resignation for good reason. The last one is resigning for no good reason. Resigning for no good reason implies that it might be a good reason for you, but not for the firm. So you might get a different job somewhere else, or you, you may not be able to work able to work for free anymore, or you may not believe in the vision of the company anymore. I mean, you may not like the people. Whatever your own reasons are, if you resign, you're leaving the company in the lurch. You're resigning for no good reason. So if you're fired for good reason, or you're resigned for no good reason, you, the individual, are making decisions that negatively impact the future of, of that company. The company deserves protection from those kinds of decisions. They deserve protection from people who are pooping out in the middle. I got a call the other day from a guy who had a CTO 
who built three quarters of the software solution and then quit and then turned around and said to the guy, if you want my software, you've got to give me, you got to pay me cash for it. So it's essentially holding the software hostage from the founder so that uh, he, the CTO can get some, some money out of the guy. And the guy can't afford to pay and his company is going to be defunct because he can't afford to work that situation out. In this situation, the CTO who quit has put the company in jeopardy. The company deserves protection from that. On the flip side of the coin, if you resign for good reason or you're fired for no good reason, the company has made decisions that put you in jeopardy, that, that negatively impact your future. And you, the individual, should be protected from that. You deserve protection from that. You can't just get fired. I've seen companies where the founder has fired employees just to get their equity back. And I'm sure people in the audience have plenty of war shorts that get fired for no good reason and get treated like, like mistreatment. So when someone, when the company makes decisions that negatively impact the future of the employee, the employee deserves protection and vice versa. So the recovery framework takes all that into account. So if you're fired for good reason, or if you're resigned for no good reason, if you leave the company in the lurch, you will lose your pie for non-cash contributions. It just disappears, it just vanishes. You will lose your multiplier for the cash contributions. So you put $1,000 in, you don't get 4,000 slices anymore, now you just get one slice. If the company can pay you back, they'll give you 1,000 bucks, you guys can park friends. What this means is it's painful for an individual to leave under these circumstances as it should be. They don't deserve to keep their slices if they leave the company in the lurch. On the flip side of the coin, you know, if you want to keep your slices, don't get fired. If you want to keep your slices, don't quit. If you want to keep your slices, don't bring a gun to work. Don't steal from the company. Act in a way that puts the company first. On the flip side of the coin, if you're fired for no good reason or resigned for good reason, the employee gets to keep all their slices, to keep their pie. If the company wants to buy them back, the employee can do that at a dollar per slice, meaning if I put in $100,000 worth of time, you've got to pay me $200,000 to get, at, get rid of me. This is an excellent return on your money, especially when the risk is so high. And it's painful for a company to let people go under the circumstances as it should be because you want the management team to think twice before they fire you for no reason or they want them to think twice before they move the company or change your job. So each to so the model has created penalties and consequences for the person making decisions about leaving the company. So here's how this works. Here's our team again. Everyone's working hard. The junior developer though is beginning to slack. He's not doing pulling his weight. The website's broken. We give him a warning. Then we give him another warning. He still does not fix it. So there's one warning, two warnings, third warning, he's fired. So, all we do is fire that guy. All he put in was time, if you remember. So his slices simply come out of the pie. They go bye-bye. No more. They just vanish. And this is a fictional unit of measure anyway, so we can do whatever we want with it. And we simply recalculate one share to reflect the fact that those slices have disappeared. So here's uh, the founder's share. Here is the rich uncle. And here is Barry, the sales guy, who came in late. Now the pie looks like this. Everyone has, percentage-wise, a little bit more because our junior developer is no longer part of our company. We still own his software, by the way. We still own his websites and his code and everything he did because that's what he did for the company. But he made decisions on how to behave that negatively impacted our future. The company was protected against the decisions by taking his shares back when he left. Everything is, is readjusted properly, but the pie may be a little bit smaller because now they've got to go hire a new technology person. Some people may not be better off. They've got to find somebody new. But the shares are allocated perfectly. So eventually, you'll want to stop using the pie. The pie will no longer be relevant. It's called freezing the pie. You freeze the pie when you have enough cash to simply pay for the contributions that you need. Remember I said if you have money, you can just pay, pay for everything and not give up any equity. I have a team of guys that do startup stuff for me. They know what I do for a living. I pay them their full market salary, and they don't get any equity whatsoever, which is fine because they're not taking any risk on my programs. Now, in an established company, you could use equity for 
incentive programs or bonus programs or golden handcuffs, but in a startup, you don't need those things because there is no cash coming in. There are no bonuses being paid. You're just you're still working on risk. So PI represents personal risk being taken. Equity option programs represent bonuses because personal risk isn't being taken. When you can pay people, you no longer need to use PI. And the two situations in which you would have enough money to pay people are generating enough revenues or getting a Series A investment. And in my book, Series A investment implies that your cash needs for the foreseeable future are going to be met. If you get an investment that does not meet your cash needs, that is an angel investment as far as I'm concerned. So, when you get revenues inside in the company, you can use those revenues to pay for whatever you want. You'd start paying for things you might otherwise consume cash, and you can pay people's salaries, and you pay your rent, and you can pay for your supplies, equipment, and everything else, your royalties and your commissions. So, here's our person worth $100,000 a year. If she's getting paid nothing, she's risking it all, which gives her 100 slices per hour. If the company starts generating revenues, and can now afford to pay her $25,000, she's now risking $75,000. Her risk has gone down. She calculates the formula, and it gives her 75 slices per hour. Now the company generates more revenue. Now they can pay her $50,000 a year. And now she's getting 50, 50 slices. That means every hour goes by, she's getting paid, plus she's contributing 50 slices an hour to the pie. If the company generates more revenues, her slices continue to go down. Eventually they pay her her full market salary, and she's no longer accruing slices. She gets to keep the slices she had before, but she's no longer getting more slices. So the pie is no longer adjusting. So in this case, our pie is frozen at 14%, 30%, 50%, and 6%. Everyone's getting their fair market salary, whatever they expect to get out of that, whatever their, their risk is being taken away. Now, eventually, your revenues will exceed your expenses, which is called profits, which is always fun to have. And you simply look at the pie, and divide the profits up according to the pie. Or if you sell the company, you divide the proceeds up according to what the pie tells you to. So every person's bet is now paying off in proportion to what they risked on the future of that company. They made a bet long ago, the bet is now paying off, and they're getting exactly in proportion to what they risked the reward the company's generated. Now, if you want to generate, raise Series A money, let's say, for instance, you've negotiated a $900,000 pre-money valuation. The pie slices have nothing to do with the pre-money valuation. It's whatever your management team can negotiate. Let's say you raised a million dollars. One million plus 900,000 is 1.9 million. That means you've sold 53% of your company to a Series A investor. So you use that million dollars to do great marketing and pay your employees and everything else and pay your rent. And now when the company generates revenues and profits, you simply split those profits or proceeds with the Series A investor. Same thing applies. But everyone's getting treated exactly perfectly fairly. The pie, as represented by these first three guys, they're, they're all getting exactly what they deserve. So what the slicing pie model has created is a perfectly fair methodology for splitting up equity. It's perfectly fair always will be, no matter what changes. You have rewarded actual contributions to the firm, not potential contributions or more hopeful com contributions. You're providing motivation, meaning that people only uh, maintain their slice when they keep working. They'll keep their, their, so their slices if they don't work, potentially, if they work less. Um, but we're providing motivation, motivation to continue contributing. We're accommodating team changes. I told you how to add someone and subtract someone. And it's flexible in the face of rapid change. We didn't have to call our attorney every single time we made a change. The pie automatically accommodated new members. And most importantly, we've gotten rid of the gators. Every single person knows that when they go into that negotiating room, they're going to get exactly what they deserve, no more and no less. They don't have to worry about getting taken advantage of by their partners. Slicing pie is a model that is free. You are free to use the model. You don't have to talk to me about it. You don't have to call me. You don't have to ask my permission. It's a totally free, use the model as you see fit. Uh, I do everything I can do to make sure that people have what they need. My mission in life is to make sure everyone gets exactly what they deserve, no more and no less. Uh, there's a spreadsheet online that you can download for free that will help you keep track of your, your pie. There's a book called Get Them Gators that you can download and distribute freely to whoever you want. It makes the case for dynamic equity splits. It's a 12-page book that explains why dynamic equity splits are important. 
if the person that you're talking to does not want to read 12 pages, they can flip to the last page, which is a one-page summary. Um, I have articles, I have videos, like this video will be posted online. There's spreadsheets, there's case studies, there's templates for letters. There's even, there's even a slicing pie game you can download for free and learn the slicing pie model and use it with your co-founders. It's also worth it to spend a little money on it if you want to, and there are some things that you can buy. For instance, I have a book called Slicing Pie. It's available on Amazon.com that you can buy. If you can't afford the book and you still want it, let me know and I'll give you a copy. There's a book called Fair and Square, which is the exact same model, just described in a different way. I got carried away and wrote a second book on the same topic. It's a little bit easier to understand, I think. Fair and Square is a little newer book. But they're both available on Amazon. Again, if you need a copy, I'll be happy to send it to you. Um, there's software at slicingpie.com that will keep track of all your slices and contributions for each person. Each person can enter their own contributions in time. Um, and uh, there's legal agreement templates. There's lawyers who have written agreements that you can download from my site. There's a fee for those. You can talk to me on the phone. Whatever it takes to get you to where you need to be with slicing pie. Again, my mission is to make sure you get exactly what you deserve, no more and no less. I hate seeing people getting taken advantage of in startup companies. Uh, if you need to contact me, it's Mike at SlicingPie.com. My Twitter is at GruntFunds. You can download the slides right here. And of course, don't forget, if you want to be a participant in this year's New Venture Lab at the University of Chicago, you can go to 34701.org or email me, and I'd be happy to provide information on that. But that's my story about Slicing Pie. I'd be happy to handle any questions you have uh, and do my best in answering them. Well, thank you so much, Mike. This was really fantastic. We are having... Um, a ton of questions coming in here. So I'm going to uh, ask a couple of these now. And for anybody who's on the line, if we aren't able to get to your question this afternoon, um, Mike, would we be able to just send you a, a download of the questions that we've received and see if you have any input for these individuals after the fact? Absolutely. Now, okay, before great. I answer questions, I, I do want to make one thing. Oh, I want to say one thing. Um, everything that you can think of is handled by this model. So if you're scratching your head right now and wondering about taxes or fair market value, everything can be addressed. So if, if you haven't learned it here or I don't answer it now, rest assured there is an answer for you. This is a complete model and it will handle everything you can possibly imagine. So give it a chance and it will. So with that being said, I'd be happy to take questions. That's, I think that's um, a great, a great little uh, tip for our listeners. We've had a lot of really specific questions, so I'm sure that um, right. they'll be looking forward to, to talking more about some of this stuff. The first question, um, a few people have brought this up. What is the best way, in your opinion, to create a binding contract or to document the model um, early on in your company? So there's a couple ways. The, the first way is is to realize that this is about more is a moral agreement more than it's a legal agreement. Now it is a legal agreement too, but it's really about doing right by people. So making it legal means you gotta first want to do right by people. And that being said, there's two contracts online. There's a number of contracts that are floating around, but there's two that I offer on my website. And one is an LLC agreement that incorporates the grunt fund rules within an LLC structure. The nice part about an LLC structure is you can divide up profits pretty much however you want. And many people choose to do what's called profit interest instead of equity interest because it gives you the same financial benefit as equity um, without the uh, underlying ownership. The other agreement uh, is a corporate standalone agreement that will work with an LLC or a C-Corp and references the division of equity using the slicing pie model. Uh, in some cases, if you, you can issue restricted shares and use slicing pie as a vesting schedule instead of a time-based vesting schedule. Um, but both contracts are fairly standard, are very standard. This is a one-size-fits-all universal framework anywhere on the planet. It will work exactly the way I've, that I described, so there's not a real need for customization. When you customize this the program, it begins to lose its effectiveness in terms of being fair. So it's a fairly boilerplate agreement for both an LLC and a C-Corp. If you're outside the country, there are attorneys all over the world who have created local. I know in the Netherlands there's an effort there. In Australia there's attorneys I can put you on to. In Canada, in London, uh, so all over the world there are, there are local attorneys. I don't have to always have an attorney in the local country, but I'd be happy to help you find one if you need a local attorney. If you are an attorney, let me know too. I'd be happy to help send you some clients. Great. Thank you. Um, and this uh, next question uh, concerns a little bit what you just mentioned. So. 
we have a scenario here where the founders of a company are each located in different countries where the fair market value for the work that they're putting in might be valued differently. Do you have any tips on approaching that situation or how to have the conversation uh, where you determine which fair market value you're going to use uh, to create the pie? Yes. So fair market value implies the market that someone exists within. Um, and it's very common for, especially for U.S. and entrepreneurs, to outsource uh, development, for instance, or certain marketing activities overseas because the market rates are so much lower there. That's a strategic thing that people do all the time. And I personally do my, my development team is located overseas. Um, you would use whatever their market rate is within their market, what they can get. So let's say you hire someone in India at a third the market rate of someone in the United States, well, their reality is they live in, market, in India and they have lower cost of living potentially and lower expenses, and so um, their fair market rate is the fair market rate that exists within their, business, within their world. Um, so you wouldn't apply one fair market rate for everybody. So if you wouldn't give the same salary as an American developer as you would an Indian developer, even if they're doing the same work. Um, if the Indian developer didn't want to work for less, they don't have to work for you. If the American uh, developer doesn't want to work for their money, they don't have to work for it. So you always pay the market rates where the market will bear. To use offer, you know, it's fair market rates, some somewhat interchangeable with opportunity costs. And so I always use the market rate that applies to that for individual person. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and for our next question, it talks about um, how many times should we um, consider reallocating our shares or our slices of the pie before um, such time as the pie needs to be frozen? Is there a point at which it no longer becomes cost effective or beneficial to reallocate the slices in the, in the pie anymore, even if you're not generating revenue potentially? So you would do it, the time you would stop using the pie is when you start generating enough revenue to pay everybody. Uh, it's a, it's a dynamic formula, meaning it's, it's a formulaic uh, model, meaning it changes all the time. So in every second of every day, theoretically, it's changing. Now, you could do it once a week, once a month. I have people who say, if you don't submit your time cards and expenses by Friday, we're going to pretend they didn't happen. Um, so whatever is practical from a management standpoint to implement. Um, but the, you wouldn't artificially freeze the pie just because you got tired of doing it, because that would make it not fair anymore. You would freeze it until the cash was available to pay everybody. Great, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so our next question has come up a couple of times. Uh, how do you uh, set reasonable expectations for both of the employer and the employee um, in terms of a good reason to potentially fire somebody? Um, we've had a lot of people chime in and say, no employer is ever going to say, I have no good reason for firing you, so um, here's the value of your contributions back. What are your suggestions for dealing with that situation before it occurs? Uh, got it. So good reason and no good reason are fairly well-documented standard practice legal agreements for employment agreements. So it's, it's not an ambiguous thing. Um, if you don't give someone a warning, that's as far as I'm concerned, that's termination with no good cause, without cause. If they bring a gun to work, these are, they're very standard. There's a, there's, they're written out very clearly in the book. It should not be ambiguous, and uh, they're, they're lifted from boilerplate employment agreements that exist all over the world. So um, the only time is he, the employer might fire someone and say it was performance-based, but if they didn't give you a warning, I don't consider it performance-based. you got to give someone a warning. But some things that are, are, are so outrageous, threatening people to work or fighting at work or bringing guns to work, um, that there, there, there's no ambiguity around it. So. Uh, if you're facing that situation and you have the rules in front of you, it's not ambiguous at all. Great, thank you. We've also had a couple of people chime in with a question about how you assign fair market value for the founder's idea. Um, do you have suggestions for that? And then also, um, is it possible in some cases that you might want to use a higher multiplier than two for the founding idea, even though it's a non-cash contribution? Um, so there's, there's two separate questions. Let me address them. They're similar. So the fair market, the, the evaluation of an idea will be based on whatever the market would pay. So uh, you know, in book publishing, I've published a bunch of books, and I get a, I get a five percent royalty in some cases on my books. Uh, for direct publishing, I get a sixty percent royalty. So it's whatever the market will pay for that particular uh, idea. 
Um, different industries have different industry standards, so you might look at the manufacturing industry or the automotive industry or the science industry, what kind of royalties they pay. There's actually a great Wikipedia article that, that outlines some standard royalty rates in different markets. Uh, in some cases, uh, advances on royalties are appropriate. Again, it has to be a reasonable advance on the royalty um, because you don't want to overpay it for an idea that doesn't turn out to make any money. With regard to changing the multipliers, I uh, used to suggest people could do that. I no longer do it because the multipliers uh, make this thing work. They're the secret ingredient that make the whole thing work, and when you start monkeying with them, it makes the model less effective. And one uh, common instinct is to, is to think that maybe risk goes down over time, so maybe the multiplier should go down over time. You never know that in a startup company. The risk is so volatile and unknowable, so you just keep them standard. So I always recommend that you keep the multipliers the same for non-cash and cash. That being said, the spreadsheet, you can edit the multipliers if you want. The software, you can edit the multipliers. I just don't recommend it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask one last question, but um, like I said, we do have quite a few more that have come in. So, Mike, if you don't mind, we'll be sending those to you later on uh, this afternoon, and, and hopefully we can get some of these answers out to our attendees. Um, but for the last question, I think this is an interesting one. How, how do you use slicing pie, or can you use slicing pie to determine who um, or what the leadership structure should look like for your company? Uh, in your example, the rich uncle, for example, may want to be in charge, but he might not be the right person to lead the company. In. So how, how might you approach that situation? Right. So slicing pie will give control to whoever deserves control. So in the, in the example I use is specifically designed, I'm, I'm glad someone noticed that, the rich uncle has authority to fire the founder in that case. That might make the founder very uncomfortable. Um, but this pie has allocated the control of the company to the right person. The rich uncle has the most risk on the line and deserves to have control. That doesn't mean he has to take control or exercise his control. It just means that he has the right to. That being said, there are a number of mechanisms you can use to maintain control separately from the equity split. For instance, in a, an LLC structure, you can appoint a manager who may not own any equity, but that person can make decisions on behalf of the firm and you might require a supermajority vote, for instance, to override that person's decision. So you can appoint a legal manager. In a, in a, in a C Corp, you could use profit interest instead of equity. So the, the founders can control 100% of the company, and you could allocate profit interest instead of equity interest to, so that the minority shareholders can enjoy the profits and proceeds of a sale without having to monkey with the underlying equity. So there are ways to secure management and decision-making control from an ownership standpoint using this model that uh, don't impact the effectiveness of the model. But if you use it just for equity, the model will give the person control who deserves to have control. Um, but hopefully you have a team that can handle that. So for instance, a, like a tech guy might put in more time in the beginning than the marketing guy, but the marketing guy kicks in later on and builds up his slices later on. So. Um, the, the, the observation is correct. The, the model will give you whoever deserves control. If you are uncomfortable with that, you can secure control in other ways. Okay. Great. Thank you again, Mike. This has been really fantastic and so informative. Um, for everybody else on the line, we're going to keep the uh, webinar open here for just a few more minutes. So if you have any more questions, feel free to submit those using the questions box down at the bottom of your GoToWebinar panel. Otherwise, you can always email us at alumnicareerservices at uchicago.edu, um, and we can also pass your questions on to Mike that way. Um, so thanks again for everyone uh, for joining us for today's presentation, and a special thank you again to you, Mike. Um, just as another reminder, please watch your email for a link to the recording of today's presentation along with the follow-up survey. Um, and we'd also like to invite you to join us online at careers.uchicagoalumni.org, where you'll find information about our upcoming events, a webinar archive, our alumni jobs board, and a form to let us know when you've hired another UChicago graduate at your organization. Thank you again, and we hope to see you at our next alumni career webinar. Thank you.